Hello and welcome to the fourth discussion event in the Sustainability First series, Together for a Fair Climate Future. The series considers the relationship between the climate crisis and fairness in society. So far, we've looked at visions for a more sustainable future, what we value in society and how to live more sustainably. This event considers the climate crisis, how the climate crisis unfairly impacts some individuals and groups more than others. We're going to focus on the UK whilst also recognising global inequalities. We'll look at ways of addressing the unequal impacts of climate change and amplifying the voices of those affected in decision making. The series is going to feed into the United Nations International Climate Change Conference later this year, and we're grateful to National Grid, who is supporting the work as a principal partner for COP26. So today's event is streaming live to YouTube, and apologies that we're a little bit late. Um, please share your questions and comments in the chat. Um, my colleague Sonia is going to be joining the YouTube discussion, um, and she's going to feed some of your questions into our event today. Please be aware that the panel can't see the chat directly as we're streaming from Zoom. And um, we've also got some video contributors today, and hopefully they'll be joining the chat, so hopefully you'll be able to talk with them. The event's got some captions and we're going to be tweeting with the hashtag Fair Climate Future. So I'll just give you some context to begin. Um, climate change is impacting all of us in different ways. Some countries, communities and individuals will be affected more severely than others. Often those who are least responsible for causing the climate crisis are those most likely to suffer its gravest consequences. Around the world, we're seeing more extreme weather, landslides, wildfires, and in the UK, there's flooding, coastal erosion, air pollution, heat waves, and water shortages. Climate change will impact wildlife and ecosystems as well as people, our well being, livelihoods, jobs, mental and physical health. It will affect people differently based on where they live their income, age, gender, race, ethnicity, disability, and access to public resources such as healthcare and housing. People's vulnerability to climate change can often result from how these factors interrelate. Climate change is already affecting people disproportion and disproportionately so who are living in poverty or without homes, marginalized groups, women, young people, the elderly, coastal communities, indigenous peoples, and small island states. As we act to both reduce, reduce our emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change, it's critical that people most impacted are central to our response in the UK and internationally, with solutions that address this environmental crisis and the underlying inequalities in our societies ensuring that collectively and individually we have the ability to prepare, respond to and recover from climate impacts. So obviously this is a huge topic today and we've got many different facets, so we're not going to be able to cover everything. The event, as I mentioned, is primarily going to focus on the impacts and actions in the UK, um, but we're, all, we're going to be covering some sensitive topics today. Um, and we're going to be looking at, it, looking at it in two parts. First, we'll consider why climate change impacts some people more than others. And we're going to share some videos of people's lived experience of climate impacts. And we'll also look at the role of art and creativity in sharing people's stories. And then second, we'll focus on how to tackle these unequal impacts and um, how to ensure the voices of those affected are heard. So um, we've got a fantastic panel today to help explore the, the um, topics and let's meet the panel. Um, hello everybody. Uh, I hope you can all, <laughs> hi, <laughs> thank you for joining. Um, I wondered if you could each introduce yourself and just say something about the work that you do, your interest in this topic, and also a little bit about how you got to where you are today um, in your role. Um, so can I start with Suzanne? Sure, yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Suzanne Subjit Kordalua and I actually entered into this work, first of all, looking at the interface of indigenous rights and extractivism. So, um, and then it evolved into looking at the climate crisis. So my work has been about leveraging the privilege I have, even as a person of color, by being in the UK to amplify the voices of those on the front line of extraction. Um, and then doing that work as a woman of color, as a CEO of an organization within the environmental movement, 
that's also meant I've had to do a lot of anti-racism, anti-white supremacy uh, work within the climate movement itself. So I do that as a anti-oppression trainer, but also as a creative by looking for forms of activism, forms of engaging that can also mean that we can continue to sustain the work. Yeah, that's me, thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Hopkins, the director of Kennel Cymru Sustain Wales. Um, Kennel is a sustainable development charity based in Cardiff. Uh, we work across sectors and industries and take an integrated approach to sustainable development. Um, we've got three core work programmes, so a low carbon economy, a fair and just society and a thriving natural environment. Um, within these areas, we provide training, consultancy, and one of the, the key things we do is we create networks um, and we bring together communities of practice, we enable collaboration to tackle these really complex um, issues. Um, uh, one of the, the areas of particular interest for me is um, involvement of um, you know, inclusivity in the discussion uh, and the move towards a net zero economy. Um, I chair a, a group of housing associations and other interested stakeholders on how we can involve um, social housing tenants in those decarbonisation plans. Um, I started at Cunnell Cymru last January, just before lockdown. Um, prior to that, I was the sustainability manager for H&M um, in Cambodia and Vietnam. So working with um, in the supply chain of H&M, um, looking to improve in particular um, the wages, but also um, looking at energy efficiency, working conditions, chemical usage. So across the whole spectrum of um, issues. Um, and before that, I trained as a, a corporate lawyer. Actually, I wanted to be a human rights lawyer, um, but for various reasons, fell into the corporate law. Um, but it didn't really sit well um, with me. So I moved over to the corporate responsibility department of a big law firm and worked um, more on community engagement, le legal advice centers, and widening access to the legal profession on various different programs with young people in East London. Brilliant, thank you very much. And Michael. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Michael Mikulevich. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the Center for Climate Justice at Glasgow, uh, Glasgow Caledonia University in Scotland. Um, and the Center for Climate Justice is a, uh, a research center that focuses on the unequal impacts of climate change uh, in the UK and um, internationally. Uh, we do research teaching and public engagement activities um, within the scope of our work. Uh, we also host a master's in climate justice and we have a PhD students in climate justice. Um, and uh, by training, I'm a human geographer. I got my PhD in human geography from the University of Manchester. And um, I think, I, I guess I've always been interested in environmental issues, which kind of led me to explore more um, more about the the biggest environmental issue of, of our time, which is climate change. And as as I learned more and more and more um, about climate change, it 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 appeared to me that you know the the consequences of 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 of, the, of climate change are very complicated for society. They're not distributed equally, um, and some people experience them more than others. So. That led me to explore climate justice as a as a field, and and luckily I I uh, I've been working here for the last three and a half years uh, on on various climate justice related issues uh, within international development and uh, with regards to intersectionality and intersectionality, intersectionality of uh, lived experiences of climate change. Thank you. That's great. And Rubina. Hey everyone, my name is Ravina Singh um, and I'm currently a Senior Engagement Officer at CDP, um, which is a global um, non-profit that runs a kind of reporting platform. And I work largely with UK local authorities, but also local authorities in the Middle East and Africa. And I encourage them to report their environmental data so that we have a much better, we have much better information about what climate action is going on at the local government level. And um, also for local authorities themselves to better understand where they're at on their journey to reach net zero and adapt to climate change. Um, and before that, I worked um, on climate policy, and this was um, both at the environmental think tank Green Alliance, but also at the renewable energy nonprofit Regen. And the reason I kind of wanted to join this event today and the reason I'm really kind of passionate about climate justice is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I have always had an interest in kind of public engagement and stakeholder engagement with climate change, particularly trying to reach communities that have felt kind of disengaged 
or have actually been excluded from issues um, relating to the climate crisis. And then the second reason is due to kind of more personal experiences. Um, I'm half Indian myself um, and in an extremely white environment sector um, and a sector where those at the top continue to largely be white men. Um, and the experiences I've had as a light skinned Asian person and the privilege that that still comes with has made it really apparent to me since I entered the sector that it is not currently inclusive or diverse. And it just doesn't really feel fit for purpose because of that. Um, and that's something that I have and will try to, to keep changing. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining today. And um, we're also joined by William Bock. Um, hello, William. Can you? Hi. <laughs> hello, Claire. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yes, I'm an interdisciplinary um, and socially engaged artist and also um, illustrator. Um, and today I'll be live, visual, visually scribing our conversation as it, um, as it emerges. So looking forward to the next 20, 30 minutes. Thank you. Um, and I'm Claire Dudney. I'm an artist. Um, I've been working in energy and climate change policy for the past 15 years. And I lead this program of work for Sustainability First. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Sustainability First is a charity and think tank focused on social, environmental and economic well-being. So let's begin. Um, we're going to start by considering people's experiences of living with the impacts of climate change and pollution and considering why these impacts might be felt unequally and by individuals and communities. We've got some really, really great videos today to share with you. Um, and yeah, let's begin um, with some of those videos. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sadie DeCoste, and I'm a co-founder and co-director of the Lost and Damaged Youth Coalition. So in order to tackle the unequal impacts of climate change, we need to provide finance to developing countries to help them deal with the most severe impacts of climate change. So we're talking climate disasters like wildfires, hurricanes, flooding, drought, sea level rise. Um, these kinds of events are referred to as loss and damage. And as youth, we're, we're really calling on governments to step up and um, provide finance to those countries and communities most affected by the impacts of climate change, um, because, you know, they have a historical responsibility as polluters to, to really rectify that injustice and, and the way that those people who are most affected by the impacts of climate change are often those who did the least to cause it. So when you flood, all your possessions are lost and memories are destroyed and your safe sanctuary from the world just goes. Flooding leaves us incredibly exhausted, but this is just the beginning because ahead is packing up all the remainder of your possessions, moving to alternative accommodation, and then your home is taken over by endless streams of people involved in the insurance reinstatement process. And this is long and has issues of its own, to be honest. You go on to try and create some sort of normality to life alongside responding to all these demands of the insurance claim and continuing your job where it becomes incredibly difficult and adds to the strain. You get concentration loss, and exhaustion to the point where you question actually your own resilience and your ability to manage everything. So a year and often more is taken from you and the impact on life, health and personal resilience after flooding, it, it is profound. My name is Rosamond Adukisi Deborah. I'm Ella Roberta's mum. I talk being Ella's mother and what exposure to air pollution means. You don't always see what's coming out of the tailpipe of a car, but that doesn't mean that something isn't coming. You only need to hear the engine. And the fact that in 2019, 8.8 .8 million people around the world died prematurely um, courtesy of air pollution. To me, it's the biggest environmental crisis I will see in my lifetime. So I don't always want this to be about me and my children. It's also about 
everybody else. I will continue to ask people to take this matter seriously because I know there will be families all over the world somewhere going through what we did. There won't be many of them, but Jonathan Griggs said it very well. He said, we are all affected by air pollution, but there are some people who are affected more than others. And Ella and, and her siblings, because they also have that susceptibility as well. So going forward, people need to think about those who are vulnerable in our society more. The immediate thing really has to be the environment bill. The action needs to be now. An analoper ha kutsch dinne koyer snacht gen es muer fo chunnerst egen a grahitje i de duf schier. Ha machrichen kornerst uyisch ne misk. Ha ahere hug ne grahitje eges edi arsch ne mare a torsch buoy mit ha. An de davile se koig gublich storm varachach skris uavesach. Ha bunskol valavanich ase hug ne je eges va porsteer an de kunnerst. Homari drach hitje, hai avestjach ge bi emuid a chien hadish kutscht in a kauser in elenjach le arst roerst. Ha uyish ne skide guhasach, far vel galak a brien di kreutjere nagas iestgeren, a ham frest on the harenjach mongorstjara er son a bibio. Shona dunya, a yemis of yak chish me and jispit it egen a gra hitje an an olopa. Fuasklux a bi, a dolabi shisvach, femer opera hug de loo re kayersnachken. Or had Gwen and Kyersnach and Tusenach Kutramach, I guess famed Aishach they were. So Sadie calls on polluters to provide finance to countries most severely affected by climate change. Heather shares the life changing experience of flooding with the loss of possessions, memories, and the stress of insurance claims. Rosamond is campaigning for air quality legislation to change following the tragic loss of her daughter, Ella Roberta. And Liam shares his experience of rising sea levels and storms along the Scottish coastline. So um, obviously we've seen from the videos um, the sorts of impacts that people might be experiencing, such as flooding, air pollution, sea level rise, and how that affects people's health and livelihoods. I wondered maybe if we could start, Michael, um, um, by talking a bit about some of the impacts that we will see um, from climate change, um, both globally and in the UK. Sure. So starting at the global level, um, we know that climate change, the other name for climate change is global warming. Uh, and, um, you know, it, that implies that the temperatures uh, around the planet are on the rise. And that is true on average. Uh, but that doesn't mean that every single place will become warmer uh, at the same rate. Uh, for example, right now we are seeing uh, huge uh, changes in the Arctic uh, and in subtropical regions. Uh, they are, <clears throat> excuse me, they are uh, being considered as the harbingers of what's to come in other parts of the world. Uh, so rapidly rising uh, the temperatures in the, for example, in the su summer, um, and uh, in in addition to rising temperatures or what follows rising temperatures, uh, is uh, increased incidence uh, and frequency of um, an intensity of heavy rains and, and, and droughts and drought, dry spells across the planet and different in different regions to different uh, extents. Uh, and of course, there's, there's sea level rise. Uh, we know that about 40% of the global population lives within 100 kilometers or 65 miles within the coast. Um, and with the uh, the global sea level rising by as ma as much as 40 centimeters by 2100, uh, that is bound to have huge impacts on those who not only depend on uh, coastal livelihoods uh, but also live on the coast. Uh, uh, and in terms of uh, the effects on the UK specifically, uh, what we predict uh, is an increased incidence and intensity of warm spells. Uh, so that means uh, warmer, wetter winters, for example, and hotter and drier. Uh, summers. Uh, I think in 2018, Scotland recorded the highest ever recorded temperature uh, in Motherwell, which was 33.2 uh, degrees, if I'm not mistaken, Celsius. Um, there's going to be more uh, weather extremes. Uh, so climate change is very much about uh, going uh, towards the extremes, whether it's on the dry or the wet side. Um, so we are going to see more flooding. Uh, we're going to see more dry spells. Uh, farmers will be will be contending with uh, with issues related to water scarcity, uh, with uh, you know failure, rain failure, and, and so forth. Um, there's also going to be 
uh, effects on our biodiversity as relatively uh, low as it is uh, on, on the British Isles. Um, but some some species will not be able to adapt fast enough to the to the growing uh, to the increasing changes uh, in the temperatures and the and the habitats. Um, and then, in terms of perhaps in terms of uh, more social impacts, um, there's going to be pressures on um, our health system. Uh, there are some uh, concerns about the vector-borne diseases being a, a, an increasingly important issue. For example, the Asian tiger muscular, which is a vector for the Zika virus and the dengue fever. Uh, that, uh, that mosquito is expected to raise, to uh, increase its, uh, its range in the UK. And that's just one example of, of what climate change will enable in terms of uh, you know disease and and, and illness um, there's also issues with food security and not just in terms of production like i mentioned with the farmers but also in terms of the cost of living uh, so food can increase uh, can increase uh, in uh, uh, the food prices can increase uh, insurance prices uh, can go up insurance premiums uh, so that was related to floods so people living in floodplains uh, might find it more or less affordable to uh, to uh, to live in certain areas, um, and we have to also, from the perspective of climate justice, we have to see, uh, pay attention to who lives in these floodplains and why they live there, uh, because very often uh, these properties are uh, are cheaper and at the same time uh, more expensive to insure. Uh, there's also uh, other kinds of health impacts, for example, mental health, uh, like some of the uh, uh, or one of the uh, uh, videos showed uh, the mental health impacts of flooding are particularly bad, uh, especially uh, for for the elderly, people who don't have safety nets, don't have support from their families, uh, or uh, even worse, are uninsured, uh, and they are forced to change their entire lively, lives and livelihoods to to adapt to the new situation. So these are just uh, a few examples of how climate change will, uh, will affect the UK and, and the planet in general. As you can see, you know, there isn't that big of a difference in terms of the, uh, the kinds of impacts or social impacts uh, between the UK and the rest of the world, but the intensity of these uh, effects will be will, will vary greatly depending on, on where, you, where you are and who you are. Um, so that's just a, an overview from, from my side. Okay, that's a really fantastic overview. Um, and you talked there about climate justice, and um, I think Suzanne also talked about that. I wondered, one of the things we're keen to do in these events is when we bring in these new terms to ex explain what we mean. Um, Suzanne, I wondered if you could say a bit more about um, what, what we mean by climate justice. And actually, also, I think we used the word intersectionality in the, in the uh, intro, and I didn't get you to explain it then, and Michael used it. But I wondered if you could talk a bit about some of those, those terms that we've been using and what they mean. Yeah, I think when we talk about climate justice, it's really important to remember the movements that that language and terminology comes from. So, um, you know, even if we're looking at the UK or the global system, we have to think about, you know, climate justice has to connect to land struggles and it has to connect to sovereignty, especially if we're talking about decolonization. So when we're talking about climate justice, we're talking about the interconnection between communities that have been resisting colonialism since 1492 and since before then, and the land grabs, the patriarchy, the genocides that have happened to those communities that live in, um, in custodianship or with the legal title to those territories. So even though sometimes we think that colonialism happened in the past, it continues now. Um, and that's the crux of when we're using that language, we have to be careful that we don't think that just diversifying um, the climate spaces are enough. It has to be that we're connected to the front lines. When we're thinking about biodiversity, um, you know, one of the first cases that comes to mind is if we think about the Amazon and centering the indigenous communities that are currently protecting the Amazon, who are under the fascism um, of Bolsonaro. Just today, we're hearing um, the deaths of indigenous communities who are protecting that. And it also connects to Gaza, and it connects to the settler colonialism, which is destroying that territory. So we have to make sure that we very, um, we don't disconnect the word climate justice from land rights. Um, and it's also, as well as talking about the impacts of climate change and those of us who um, and our communities who are on the impacts of the um, effects of climate change, it's also about the analysis and the understanding of the climate crisis that we hold, that we see as a continuation 
of you know, the British government's involvement in Punjab and the farmers' protests that we see happening there. So that was, that's one thing I would say is about climate justice and decolonization is that it's connected to the land territories. And that connects us to the fact that when we talk about climate change, we're often thinking about future scenarios, something in the future. But if you've been to sites of ecocide, if you've seen what's happening in the Alberta tar sands, if you've been to the Niger Delta, we're already living in that reality. Some communities have been sheltered from that. So I think that's also something to think about time, about climate justice means that many communities, many of us are living between those two realities, that we're seeing the impacts here, but we're also fighting daily to get basic humanitarian care to our communities who are already on that front line. So those are two things I would say about climate justice. Um, and then intersectionality, um, as well as become a little bit misused, um, but it's to understand that there's a cumulative impact of the effects of climate change. And I think, you know, Ravina and I both have sort of pointed to the point, even as women of color, we exhibit a series of privileges in relationship to our black and indigenous um, relatives. So it's about the, it, the piling on top of the factors that you, and the struggles that you have to deal with in resisting to that. So we have to make sure that we're constantly giving space ourselves, even as people of color, to those of us um, who have, we have blind spots for what those experiences are of climate change as well. Thank you very much. And maybe Ravina, if you could build on that, just talking about why um, the climate crisis does impact some people more than others and who might be affected most. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Claire. Um, I mean, this is a huge, a huge question, a huge issue. Um, so I can't kind of cover every way in which it affects, you know, different people differently. Um, but um, I think the first thing I would say is that climate change does not care about impacting people fairly. It does not care about who's ready for it, who can handle it. You know, all these different issues, it doesn't care. So we have to kind of remember that. But I think the second thing um, that I'll focus on a little bit more is that we don't live in an equal society. And I want to focus on that a little bit more because that's something we can change and we can do something about and we need to. Um, so firstly, women are more likely to be affected than men um, by climate change, and that's largely because they're often the primary caregivers still. Women are more likely to have less socioeconomic power than men, and yet sadly women are still often being excluded from decision making and not being invited to the table still. Secondly, impacts differ depending on your race. Um, so in the UK, it tends to be that people of colour, um, particularly in London, more commonly live in kind of inner city urban neighbourhoods and are therefore disproportionately affected by air pollution, as has been actually proven now, really good, in the devastating death of Ella Roberta. But we not only need to be tackling air pollution, but we need to be tackling systemic reasons that people of colour are more vulnerable to it. It's not a coincidence. There are systemic reasons that they are more vulnerable and we need to be thinking about that and asking those questions. Um, and the, uh, the impacts can also differ if you are living with any disabilities and because unfortunately this can, not always, but it can make you more vulnerable to the impacts. But it's also because those living with a disability are often not being reached and are often not being engaged when we're thinking about the solutions to protecting the most vulnerable. So we really, and we'll kind of talk about this later, but, you know, really involving those, those members of the community as well. And then other reasons um, is includes age. Um, so just an example, the elderly are much more vulnerable to, to impacts such as extreme heat and they're much more likely to suffer death from extreme heat. Um, but of course, then you have the kind of intergenerational impact of the youth. And it's really great we heard from youth um, activists and the, the kind of this is their future. This is, you know, a certainty that as they grow up, this is going to get worse and worse and worse. And it's there's a lot of kind of difficulty with feeling that they didn't cause it, but they are going to have to deal with the impacts, which is really challenging. Um, and another reason just to kind of finish up is wealth and jobs. So some can afford to buy air conditioning, some can afford to move away from coastal towns in the UK, can adapt their homes to protect themselves from the impacts, whilst others just can't afford to do this. So there's that kind of wealth divide as well. Um, and of course, kind of with jobs, there will be certain jobs kind of especially associated with the fossil fuel sector, we desperately need to move away from that. But what does that mean for the security of jobs for certain people? We need to be seeing green jobs, but we need to be seeing kind of good, kind of secure, 
sustainable jobs um, for those who are really at, at risk um, from losing their kind of livelihoods. Thank you, that's great. And I wondered, Sarah, maybe if you could build on that just by talking about some of the, um, the ways in which climate change is impacting people in the UK today and what some of the consequences yeah. might be in terms of their well-being, their health, the mental yeah. health. Yeah, absolutely. So we're already seeing, you know, direct effects of climate change. It is happening here and now. Um, you know, we, the UK Climate Change Committee has found that as far back as 2003, the heat wave had killed 2,000 people across the UK. Um, looking at the wettest um, February on record last year in Wales, um, you know, flooding is one of the main impacts of climate change. We're already seeing um, over 3,000 homes completely destroyed, leaving people, as we heard in the video, you know, with huge um, financial mental health burdens. Um, we're also seeing um, rising sea levels already. So there is a town called Fairbourne in, in, in Gwynedd that is probably going to be the first town in the UK to actually be decommissioned. This means moving people out of their homes permanently. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about 400 homes and almost a thousand people um, that will have to be moved um, permanently. But at the moment, the council has not told these people, you know, when they will be moving. There's no clear plan in place and who is going to bear the costs of this. So, you know, this is happening here and now and I think that is really important to remember. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the, the overlaps between being economically vulnerable and being vulnerable to flooding. Um, you know, around 120,000 new homes were built um, in the last decade. Many of these are on floodplains. Um, there's a really good Guardian article that was just released um, showing this link between those um, that are economically vulnerable to flooding um, are also um, in, in these areas. Um, and then, as we heard, as Ravina said, you know, there's a clear correlation between nitrogen dioxide emissions and poor air pollution from road transport and local deprivation. Um, you know, we know that air, air pollution also disproportionately affects black um, communities and Asian communities. Um, and I think it's really important for us to bear this in mind. Um, I also just want to mention, you know, uh, as a white woman, um, I have I have done been actively trying to learn and understand um, about the impacts um, on communities that I don't have experience with. Um, and a couple of links that I found really helpful in this is um, Jocelyn Longdon's site, Climate in Colour, um, and then also um, Friends of the Earth. Um, there was a recent podcast about how climate and racism are connected. So I'd really encourage any anybody out there to actively try and understand um, and understand different perspectives and experiences that you might not, you know, that you don't have um, as a person of privilege um, just by being white. Um, yeah, we, we talked also about issues of inter intergenerational fairness and, um, you know, younger people are going to have to bear the consequences of what the older generation has done. Um, so I also just, you know, the other impacts um, of climate change are also felt then in this transition to um, a low carbon economy. Um, and I think if we're not careful, um, the transition could exacerbate the existing inequalities, but also it could be an opportunity to create a fairer society. Um, and in, in the kind of decarbonisation language, we talk about the co-benefits of decarbonisation. So I thought I'd just give a couple of examples on, on these of these co-benefits. And, and this is what we're aiming for. We do not want this the transition to net zero to um, be a, an opportunity to widen these inequalities further. So for example, um, retrofitting of housing to make them more uh, energy efficient. Um, this can go hand in hand with addressing issues of fuel poverty. Um, we can strengthen and bring communities together around renewable energy projects and other low carbon solutions. Um, there's opportunities, as Ravina said, for new and improved jobs um, in housing retrofit, renewable energy, um, wind farms. Um, creating jobs and education that are closer to home, um, that uh, more active travel, active travel, cheaper travel, um, and also low carb, low carb travel, um, low carbon travel. Sorry, <laughs> um, and then also nature-based solutions um, and increasing green space. Um, these have corresponding um, opportunities to improve mental health and well-being. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder maybe now, actually, if we could go over to Sonia um, for a question from the audience. 
Sure, yeah. So um, lots of great discussion and actually lots of what the audience is discussing will be talked about in the next session or the next section rather of the event. Um, so just one question is, uh, so how do institutional factors, so for example, policy, spending, planet, uh, planning rather, affect vulnerability to the impacts of climate change? So I know Suzanne spoke a bit about colonialism, but how do we sort of think about it in the present day as well? Okay, does anyone want to come in on that? Michael, yeah, go for it. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, this is this relates to the broader question of what vulnerability actually is um, and, and how it's produced. So in in the world of, of, of research on climate change, uh, in the climate justice uh, field specifically, um, you know, the research first started with saying, okay, well, people are vulnerable uh, because they reside in floodplains, uh, or people are vulnerable because um, because they are uh, not able to uh, buy insurance or retrofit their homes or or things like that. So it's very very much focused on the on the biophysical impact of climate change, uh, and that's where the discussion kind of ended. And now, um, with uh, with years as the years passed, uh, this kind of concept of vulnerability got elaborated a little bit more and now we are moving away from just looking at or I, I would like to say we have moved away from just looking at the exposure um, of to, to a biophysical impact like flooding uh, to the socio-economic determinants of people's vulnerability um, so here we are asking uh, not in what ways people are, are in those floodplains are affected by the floods. But we are asking, like like Suzanne and, and Ravina were mentioning, why are these people in the first place residing in those floods? Uh, floodplains, sorry. Um, so we are, we are uh, and the moment you ask this question, that's when you get to the institutional factors that led to uh, to those the, those individuals residing in, in that floodplain. So uh, it, in many ways, uh, you know, environmental and climate justice issues are constructed politically. Uh, in some, in some, in some ways, they are unintentional. In some other cases, they are intentional. Uh, for example, if you look at the case of uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, um, in in, uh, in 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 the states, uh, the reason why uh, the the black population of the city uh, was affected disproportionately by by uh, Katrina was because they were residing in, in more vulnerable places and the reason why they were residing in more vulnerable places more exposed places was that the white uh, residents were able to move out of those those neighborhoods uh, towards the more uh, kind of uh, resilient let's say uh, places within the city even um, so you can and, and the reason why the uh, the black residents were not able to move uh, along along with along with with the white residents and I'm pretty simplifying this here um, is because there was a policy that prevented prevented uh, black Americans from getting more public publicly secured mortgages uh, and that was by design uh, so so you know this is this is just one example of how institutional factors how policy uh, intentional policy in, in in this in this case leads to climate injustice and and into the loss of lives and livelihoods so Yes, institutional factors have a huge, huge role in determining people's vulnerability. I would actually say that climate change is not an um, environmental issue. That's what I thought I was getting into this field. Climate change is a social issue um, more than an environmental issue. Um, and, and, and that's why you know, we, we have to think about the institutional processes that determine people's vulnerability. We have to ask these difficult questions of why some people are poorer than others. Why are some people more educated than others? Uh, why does ethnicity here uh, really matter? Um, so, uh, so yeah, these are the questions that we have to look at when talking about institutional factors. But yes, uh, long story short, vulnerability is socially constructed. It's not constructed by climate change. Climate, uh, the only thing that climate change does is making these vulnerabilities visible. Um, so, so the vulnerabilities are already there. They weren't caused by climate change. That's the, the bottom line. I just want to make one point in response to that. Um, you know, when we're talking about colonialism and this idea that it ended, I think it's really important to understand how it exists right now in institutions. A lot of the work that I've been doing has been around banking policy, insurance policy, 
and how the rights of indigenous peoples to assert their free prior informed consent. So that connects to the consent and the rights of indigenous people, the violence against women as well. Um, so that's how it's taking place now. Um, for instance, now with the slashing of funds from water aid and from those um, ability for UK policy to impact on mitigation and adaptation strategies. So I think we have to keep that in our um, imaginations and in our understanding that colonialism hasn't ended, it's just ramped up um, and the impacts. And so that just is to keep our accountability and to understand the role that we play in holding those institutions accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you all. That was really fantastic discussion. And I think now we're going to move on to our next topic, which is really thinking about what we can do about these issues that we've just highlighted. Um, so we're going to start by um, having some, um, some video contributions and we're going to look at um, really how we can start to think about tackling these une unequal impacts and how we can consider people's lived experiences of climate change um, and bring those voices out in policy discussions. So let's get the videos. To tackle climate change and ecology demise, we have great science and significantly indigenous knowledge, which together are really important for local and global repair. We know what to do, but we have evidence that we inhabit an unequal world. Colonialism created climate change and destroyed our ecology and sadly, climate continues to manifest as a racist crisis. My own research looks at the intersection of oppressions on environment and I find really clear evidence that environmentalism is broadly universal. Black communities are equal and in places more advanced in their awareness of climate and what we need to do to stop and want to change. The problem that we have is barriers, exclusion, racism, a lack of climate and social justice and not enough gender-based solutions. I'm afraid the evidence suggests we're not likely to tackle unequal impacts unless we solve systemic racism first. I'm not even sure a Green New Deal or degrowth will work unless inequality is managed. We're on a handcart to hell. It must be everyone together with no one left behind. Hello, my name is Paul Cobbing and I'm Chief Executive of the National Flood Forum. Climate change is already having an impact on people's lives and flooding in Britain affects thousands of people every year. It has a significant and long-term impact on health, mental health, well-being, life chances and economics. Not everybody is affected equally. For example, those who are poor or don't have insurance lack the resources to put their lives back together. For those who are ill, this is an additional burden and people in rented homes can't rely on their landlords being insured or to rehouse them, or to reinstate their homes. Groups that are disproportionately affected are ethnic minorities communities everywhere, northern post-industrial towns and cities, and coastal towns. Small communities, urban but especially rural, where the costs of protective measures never stack up, are also affected. The risks continue to grow. Our ambition to tackle flooding needs to grow with it, but we need to focus on those who are affected the most those who often have the smallest voices, the most vulnerable. Disabled Scots may be hit hard by climate change. Extreme weather can be very problematic for disabled Scots, many of whom already live in poverty, are more prone to health risks and less likely to have insurance that protects their assets and homes. Ground floor and level access properties favoured by many people with mobility impairments can be particularly prone to flooding. So. Like many others, disabled Scots are calling for action to address climate change, but we really need to respond in ways that do not discriminate against disabled people or cause them unnecessary disadvantage. For example, many disabled Scots are reliant on cars or taxis as public transport is not accessible to them. When planning for low carbon cities, we need to ensure that those who cannot walk, cycle or use buses and trains are not disadvantaged. Disabled people face barriers to recycling, active travel, making their homes energy efficient or even protesting about the climate emergency and getting involved in local decision making and emergency planning. They are often overlooked in our responses to a changing climate. As disabled people, we need to be listened to and our needs and perspectives and our priorities need to be taken into account to ensure a fair transition to net zero in Scotland. 
After all, it's our planet too. Hello, my name is Ineza Umhoza Grace. I am an ecofeminist, impact driven actor in the climate change and environment protection sector based in Rwanda. The impact of climate change in Rwanda is enormous. Not only as a developing country, we are striving to achieve development, but as a global South youth, climate change is washing away my ability to achieve development because it's not fair for my country with minimum contribution to greenhouse gas emission to be using its small GDP to respond to the effect of climate change. And this is true for most of the vulnerable country. So what we are doing in the Green Fighter is we are aiming to train young people to be active of change by designing projects and conducting, um, uh, conducting them in the community. And also we aim to raise uh, or like empower young uh, people to be active of change in their community. Hi, I'm Sunita, I'm 26, I live in Blaina Gwent and I took part in the Blaina Gwent Climate Assembly. For a long time now, I have been saddened by climate change and the devastating consequences that it has for our planet. It's time that we held the authorities accountable for the inequalities amongst their communities. You can ask people to change their habits and to change their lives in order to tackle the climate crisis. But we can't do that if we are not given the correct facilities that we need in order to do so. You can't ask communities to change without enabling that change from a higher place. People can't use public transport when the services are unreliable and inconvenient. Don't just retrofit people's houses. Start with the civic buildings and work your way down. Plant trees. Take care of our green spaces. Show people that you will change as much as you were asking us to change. It is up to the governing bodies to provide education, better jobs and better accessibility to the things that we need in order to tackle the climate crisis as a community. Thank you for those wonderful videos. Um, so Michael highlights the interlinkages between climate change and systemic racism. Paul suggests we need to amplify the voices of the most vulnerable. Susie explains some of the challenges faced by disabled people in accessing buildings, transport and even protesting, urging that low carbon towns and cities be designed with disabled people in mind. Ineza talks about the climate impacts in Rwanda and how young people can be empowered as actors of change in the community. And Sunita calls on authorities and decision makers to show leadership to tackle inequalities. So um, I wondered if we could start by talking about the, how we can ensure the kind of needs and the voices and leadership of those who are most impacted are central to our UK's response to the climate crisis. Um, maybe Sarah, if you could come in on this um, and say something also about, I think you've been involved in some citizens assemblies, say something about sort of how local people are getting involved in discussions on climate change. Yeah, sure. So um, a citizens assembly, I'll start with the citizens assembly part and then come to the next bit. It's, it's basically a group of people who are brought together to discuss an issue and reach a conclusion about what they think should happen. Um, so a, a kind of traditional citizens assembly has three phases. Um, learning, which is an opportunity to learn from experts, but also to share lived experiences within the community um, or nationally, which, which can differ quite a lot. Um, and then deliberate, discuss, and then come up with recommendations. Um, so the people that take part in the Citizens' Assembly are chosen um, so that they reflect the wider population um, or the population of the local area. So in terms of demographics, so diversity of age, uh, gender, ethnicity, um, and also levels of poverty and attitude to climate change when we're talking about a citizens assembly on climate, for example. Um, so I think that the, it's, it, the citizens assembly ha has a, there's a kind of set of, of rules about um, the guidelines, I suppose, that have been um, have been drawn up. Um, so there, that's on the involved site. And um, it's one method of involving people in uh, in policy and in decision making. So there's also um, climate juries that have been used by the IPPR, for example, in the Environmental Justice Commission. And um, then there's like big local community groups, which are run by the local trust. I think there's about 150 across the UK and they're funded for 10 to 15 years um, to look at solutions, to bring together the communities for solutions for the local areas. Um, and so, 
the Citizens Assembly in Blino Gwent um, that I was recently involved with, with uh, the Electoral Reform Society and four housing associations, um, asked the question, what should we do in Blino Gwent to tackle the climate crisis in a way that's fair and improves living standards for everyone? Um, it wasn't commissioned in, in the usual way. So what we've seen at, at is the trend in um, local authorities declaring uh, climate emergencies and then holding uh, citizens assemblies to ensure that there's involvement in the communities in decarbonisation plans. Um, however, um, the housing associations and the local authority um, had agreed to um, use the to respond to the recommendations and to also use these in the plans for the local area. So it is um, it is a good one of a kind of a, a number of tools that can be used to ensure that there is um, the diversity in the responses and the involvement of communities. Um, I think just on your um, the second question about um, there are some challenges when you bring people together that might not have otherwise engaged in climate change. Um, you know, some uh, don't believe it exists. Um, others, uh, it cannot be a priority because, um, you know, they're looking at how to pay the bills and, um, you know, issues of health, um, concerns about crime are far more immediate. Um, I think, you know, there's been research done and a great report released recently um, by the IPPR on climate and, and communities. Um, it makes the point, it's about how we frame it. So um, if it's framed in a way that presents an opportunity to reorganize the local economy, to create jobs and skills, it can be, um, you know, it can be a much better tool to engage people and bring people on board. Um, and so for some, you know, mitigating climate change, adapting to climate change will be the co-benefit of other measures. Um, for example, reducing fuel poverty um, or, you know, having better waste services. Thank you. Um, and um, Suzanne, I wondered maybe if you could talk a bit about um, how people can share their experiences of climate change. And obviously we heard from Ineza um, about her experiences in Rwanda. Like, how could we bring in some of those international experiences um, into the debates we're having in the UK? This is probably too many questions, but also I know that you do some creative work with artists. So are there ways that people can tell their stories creatively and really inspire change? Yeah, I think for me, um, the reason why I've had to be an artist in this work has been for survival. As a woman of colour working in the climate movement, um, for the last decade, I've been fighting for basic representation. I think the movement's actually gone backwards. Um, so the reason why I had to work with art was to get people to look at the culture of climate activism itself, to look at how it was white supremacist, um, it's the second least diverse industry in the UK. So the, the way that I worked with art was to create spaces of safe spaces to look at what were the design decisions? What are the forms of activism that people are using? And why is that acting as a barrier or an entry point? So one of the ways that I've been um, tackling that white supremacy has been working with podcasting. I think podcasting is great. Um, especially in terms of coronavirus to, again, lift up not just the, the strategies or the difficulties um, that we've been going through, but also our analysis and also to create space, safe spaces where we can engage. Um, there's also few spaces for us to talk openly about the racism that we experience from fear of losing our jobs. Um, I personally don't have any funding, um, despite my profile, years of experience, to do this work. So we need a real wake up call from within the community to be in allyship, to sustain us to do the work. And so this next generation isn't necessarily having to fight that. So when we talk about creativity, we talk about um, you know, having spirituality, having connection to nature. And as people of color, even having access to nature comes with a violence in England, in the UK, especially for black communities to even be in those spaces. So when we mean creativity, we mean literally, how can I physically survive even being a climate activist in that space? Um, and I think that comes with really great relationships of I'm working with a theatre company at the moment to talk about the experience of a young black man of working in XR and the racism and the violence and the complete erasure of us from that. So I think when we're thinking about creativity, it's about self-reflecting on the culture itself, thinking about how we're even going to have jobs to do this. 
and safe spaces so that we can have allyship and creative alliances because it might not look like um, protesting, shutting things down. Those of us have done some of that, but the creativity is about how do we analyze the situation? What skills, what resources, what collaborations do we need to move that forward? So I think that's a really, um, and also to keep ourselves um, enlivened as well. As I mentioned, you know, many of us are seeing horrors back home as we're trying to move through this crisis as well. So we also need that creativity um, to sustain us as well. Thank you. And then just thinking a bit about that kind of um, local, how we can engage locally. I wondered, Sunita talked about leadership by people in authorities. Um, and I wondered maybe, Ravina, if you could talk about the role that um, local actors, government can play um, in involving people. Yeah, absolutely. So from kind of a lot of the work that I've done for the past kind of couple of years, working really closely with UK local authorities, particularly, I mean, there is so much ambition from local from the local authorities that I've worked with, like they really do want to do the work and they really do care about this. And also quite rightly, there's a lot of pressure coming from local communities. Um, you know, for local authorities to not just kind of declare climate emergencies, but actually do the work. And that really is making a difference, which is fantastic. But unfortunately, a lot of the local authorities just don't have the money or the resources or the in-house expertise sometimes to tackle this at kind of the scale that we need. Um, I mean, thankfully, there are kind of organisations like Mind CDP, um, the LGA, the Local Government Association, Friends of the Earth that's been mentioned, Green Alliance, that are kind of putting pressure on national government, kind of taking the, the, the kind of interviews that I've done with local authorities and the feedback that I'm getting, I'm really putting pressure on national government to kind of recognise and fund local authority, authorities to do this work. Um, and I'm working really closely with local authorities to try and foster kind of knowledge sharing between each other and um, track what action is kind of being taken and also encourage them to, where possible, implement inclusive climate action plans. I can kind of use examples a little bit later. Um, but local authorities are in such a good position in terms of being connected to local communities and local residents able to do things like Sarah's talked about, citizens' assemblies, um, like, for example, you know, loads of local authorities, but Oxford City Council did a really fantastic one, um, and just have a very good understanding of the local challenges and what solutions may work best for their area. You know, there's so many kind of options, strategies, solutions, and it's really about kind of trying to help them and work with them to understand what works best for their local authority and their kind of local community as well. Thank you very much. And maybe, um, Michael, could you talk a little bit about, I mean, we often think about the things we need to do to, um, you know, to sort of reduce our carbon um, impact, but um, what do we need to do to actually adapt to what is happening, the, change, the changes that we're seeing um, from climate change? Uh, so, yeah, um, that's definitely, you know, the behavior change aspect is, is important and, and how we li live our lives and what kind of, kind of carbon footprint we have on the planet is important. But uh, in many cases, the concern is that the moment you, you turn to a very sustainable lifestyle, you, you feel like you, you're up the hook, right? Uh, so you, you're doing your share. And that's a flawed view because that's not, unfortunately, in our current situation, with about 10 years left to, to kind of uh, prevent disastrous climate change uh, impacts, according to, the, uh, you know, to international scientists, that's, that's just not going to, to uh, cut it. So what, can, what else should be done? Well, I think that the, the most important part to note, to note here is that we have the solutions. We have the technologies. We have the knowledge required to, uh, to address climate change impacts uh, and causes. Uh, it's a matter of political will, uh, and whether it's at the local government level, national uh, international level, uh, but like like Ravina said, uh, there's plenty of goodwill uh, among local governments. Uh, if, for example, here in, in Scotland, uh, there's a local council, South Lanarkshire, that has just announced a climate challenge fund, and as part of that, they are uh, in, they are funding a PhD studentship on climate justice in their council area, which is fantastic. Um, so. So there's definitely, you know, I, I think that kind of uh, activity comes from pressure from 
from the residents, from from voters, from people, from stakeholders. Um, so, in terms of what has to be done at a, at a more systemic, more or national at least level, uh, sure, we need policies that look at adaptation, and mitigation. Uh, in the in the case of mitigation, we have we're looking at just transition, which essentially means. Uh, you know, solving the uh, the transition to a low carbon economy in a way that doesn't affect some people more than others. So, in again, going back to the Scottish example, the Northeast Aberdeen. You know, you've got the BP and Shell headquarters for the North Sea in in the northeast of Scotland. What will those thousands of workers do if we decommission all those oil rigs? Uh, um, you know, and that's also a climate injustice. Uh, so we need to think about how to how to uh, promote that kind of just transition not just a transition but a just transition and in terms of adapting i mean adaptation is such a complicated process uh, it's so context specific um and you know above and beyond all those you know policies and all, all the funding that we require and that's that's all good and well i think what the, what governments need to do is to listen listen and engage communities because uh, you know and and I think it's very important to remember that it's not just the impacts are disproportionate in communities, uh, in certain communities, but at the same time, communities also can come up with solutions. So in, in discussing, and maybe we have all been a little bit guilty, guilty of that, even if it, even during this event, we've been discussing the disproportionate vulnerability of, of certain groups, but we have to underscore that these groups also have huge amounts of agency and results, resourcefulness and, and creativity in producing these solutions. And it's important to make governments and those in power to, to, to listen. Uh, and that really is difficult because it's time consuming, it's expensive, uh, it's uncomfortable in many ways, um, but it, it has to be done because it cannot be a top down response to adaptation that we, uh, that we, that we take. Um, and just, yeah, and then just lastly, uh, maybe kind of uh, responding to your question, Claire, in a, in a, in a kind of a, from a different angle, what should the UK do to adapt? Well, the UK should fund international aid to help other parts of the world uh, in adapting. Uh, like uh, Suzanne has, has said, uh, you know, the the uh, legacy of colonialism is very much alive. Uh, we can talk about, I would, I would say we're in the era of neo-colonialism. Uh, it's still exerting influence over other countries, but through more you know, um, uh, invisible uh, or or um, uh, yeah, I would say invisible means. Um, so I would say making peace with that responsibility, that historical responsibility that the UK has towards other countries, not just in terms of colonials, but even specifically in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution started here on this island. So, um, so there's definitely a lot that the UK uh, has to offer and should offer to the rest of the world in terms of how to adapt and how to mitigate. We're talking about funds for uh, adaptation projects and programs, social protection programs abroad, uh, mitigation technologies. So, you know, all the patents very often are here in the West. Um, if we can see with the COVID vaccine, there's no wrangling right now, like who has, the, has access to patents, who can produce the vaccine. The same applies to climate technology. Um, who has the, the power to, or the, the knowledge to produce solar panels even, or wind, wind, uh, windmills and so forth. So plenty of stuff that can be done to adapt and to mitigate climate change at different levels. Uh, what I would like to just stress uh, is that individual level, the individual level is important and we shouldn't, you know, uh, ignore that. But the systemic level is key in my opinion and political action, exerting political pressure on those in power uh, is necessary without that um, it will the change will just be cosmetic and it will it will not will not um, change the systemic causes of climate change and, and inequality thank you very much so exerting political power is really important and i wonder if maybe um if we could just have like one thing from um from each of you maybe because michael you've just um, given your kind of um, final, <laughs> your final piece. Um, Good. <laughs> Sarah and Ravina and Susan, you could just say kind of one thing that you really feel we need to do to tackle these unequal impacts of climate change. So maybe um, Suzanne, if I start with you. Yeah, just kind of building on from what Michael said there, I think and something that hasn't come up has been Brexit and increasing fascism in the UK and what that means for climate refugees. 
um, we're already seeing that. So I think we also have to make sure this is grounded in a humanitarian response, just like we've had to activate um, systems of mutual aid and mutual care. We really need to be thinking about that. And that's about the time frame of thinking that this is happening now. Um, so how do we mobilize both the technology, the infrastructure, you know, working with new economies like cryptocurrencies to get the capital that we need for the immediate human cost that we know that the fascist governments that we currently have aren't going to be respond to. So I think that's the other level in which I would um, activate or ask for that compassion and also to understand when you're bringing people of color into these spaces of climate change, especially right now, we're devastated by what we're seeing back home. Um, so also providing that care and support for us and thinking about how we're even going to, as women of color, people of color, do this work. And that means literally moving resources to us today. So thank you. Aravina? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think my kind of key message is that we've just got to stop thinking of issues of social and environmental justice as separate. We cannot and we should not achieve one without tackling the other. And this really goes for kind of everyone working in the environment space, kind of as, as kind of broad as that is. Um, national government, local government, NGOs, activist groups, you know, people in the creative industry as well that are doing some amazing stuff. Um, if you work for kind of, yeah, in the environment space, have a look around you and think about how representative your organisation, what, whatever kind of term you see that is, um, who is making those decisions, who is being consulted in those key decisions, which when we're talking about environmental issues is affecting the general public, is affecting the globe. So who are making those key decisions and kind of what kind of people are being, being considered and being directly involved and also think about how through kind of your work and your life even if you don't work in the environment sector how you can help achieve climate justice in kind of small but really important ways thank you and Sarah um, yeah, I think, you know, picking up on uh, what Ravina said and a few others in terms of, um, you know, there is will from local authorities, but there is a lack of funding to um, lack funding and a lack of, you know, therefore time to listen and to engage with the local communities. Um, you know, we are looking at a lot of the changes that need to happen to net zero and now coming down to under the, the control of local authorities. Um, I would say there needs to be much more funding um, put to investing in community groups and in um, participatory processes to co-produce these solutions. Um, you know, involving people is so um, important in, um, in the transition to net zero to ensure that it is fair for everybody. Thank you all for sharing your perspectives with us today and it has been fantastic to hear your different um, views and obviously we've just kind of touched the surface of this and I hope that we'll be able to continue these discussions with you um, in the lead up and after the climate change conference. Um, Sharon's um, now joined us, hopefully um, she's going to be able to give us a little um, summary of some of the things that we've been talking about whilst looking at William's um, fantastic illustration um, and uh, yeah let's have a look at those now, thank you. Well, thank you all for a fantastic discussion. We've covered all sorts of issues. And William's uh, illustration, I think, really captures the breadth of some of the things we've been talking about today. Um, as William's illustrated with his pictures of floods, um, we, climate change is here with us now. The impacts are happening now. This isn't just about something that's going to happen in the future. And disasters don't discriminate, they can affect everyone and the risks are continuing to grow. But as we've heard today, some people are being impacted more than others in this change. And we need to really understand the fact that we live in an unequal society and these risks will be felt unequally. Some people can't afford to take the steps and changes that they might need to insulate them from the worst effects of climate change. They can't get insu insurance, for example, um, and they might be forced to live in housing which might flood more often. Uh, they can't get air conditioning to cope with those hot summer nights that we're going to get more and more of. Climate change, as we've heard, is really making the existing vulnerabilities that people experience far more visible. And we need to really understand some of the underlying historical reasons why we've got the climate change that we've got here at the moment, 
both globally, but also in the UK, and how many of the communities and people from different backgrounds in the UK, through their complex identities and their long backgrounds, may be experiencing real hardship and, and problems with their wider families. So we need to really show compassion. We need to understand some of those systemic issues that are leading to those impacts. And as I think Ravina said, we need to really understand that social and environmental issues aren't separate. They do come together. We've heard very movingly about the need to really reinvest and invest more strongly in local communities and look at how we can fund local authorities and local people to cope with some of the worst impacts of climate change. And that involves bringing communities into the discussion, hearing about the views of different people, what their needs, what their wants, what their preferences are, and engaging with them through mechanisms like climate assemblies. And we've got the little rainbow that William has drawn for us there, illustrating climate assemblies. So how can we engage those groups um, and involve them more? Creativity is one way to do that. Um, and William has drawn a little picture about creativity, helping bring about new collaborations and helping re people reflect on different ways of doing things and using new platforms like podcasts to reach out into different groups and to have those conversations. Different people need to be brought around the table if we're going to develop more innovative ways of tackling these problems but it needs to be re representative of all the communities in the UK, that engagement to be really meaningful. And it needs to lead to real positive changes. It needs to lead to good jobs, which are secure for a more fair climate future. And we need political action. Individuals and communities can do this, but there are some really deep systemic issues which impact on the climate and we need political leadership to help us address those. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we've covered a tremendous amount of ground. As Claire said at the beginning, this is part of a wider discussion events, series of discussion events that we're holding in the run up to the Climate Change Conference. In future events, we're going to be discussing the role of technology in engaging people on climate issues and climate leadership. We're also going to be hosting a conference on the social and cultural change that's needed uh, for, to address the climate crisis. And that's on the 21st and 22nd of September. The conference will be far more interactive to, than today. So please do look at our website for more details as we put them up. We'd also like to mention that last week we launched our latest 2021 Art and Writing Prizes again on the theme of Together for a Fair Climate Future. So please do apply and look at our website for more details and share your creative visions for the future. We're also this month kicking off a series of school outreach programmes on the theme of Together for a Fair Climate Future. So if you're involved in education, please do look those up. And we're doing that with a great science share for schools. So once again, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you in particular to our fantastic panel. They've given us some really, really good challenges and good food for thought in these areas um, and really inspired us all, I think, to go away and take action. I'd also like to thank William for his brilliant uh, scribing and his images from today. They again will be on our website afterwards. And I'd particularly like to thank Claire and the rest of the Sustainability First team for putting together this wonderful event and for all their hard work. I'd like to thank National Grid for sponsoring the programme. And once again, you all for joining us today. Have a good afternoon. and We look forward to seeing you on the next discussion event. Thank you. <laughs>